When you think of cookie dough, strawberry shortcake, or birthday cake, the first thing that probably comes to mind is desserts. For some people though, these desserts remind them not of something edible, but of slime. Slime is arguably one of the biggest pop culture phenomena of the last few years, and with scents and themes like cookie dough, strawberry shortcake, and birthday cake, how could it not be? Modern slime is marketed mainly as a children's toy, though it's also used for relaxation, fidgeting, and ASMR too. With how many different slime types, manufacturers, and satisfying content creators there are, it can be easy to get caught up in the current slime culture without remembering that slime is a bit different than it was before Cookies and Cream was on the slime menu. One of the very first slime products marketed to children was the vaguely named Super Stuff by Whammo in the early 1960s. Whammo was pretty well known for making unusual and inventive toys, so a container full of goop wasn't necessarily that strange to see at the time, at least not to kids. Super Stuff originally came as a packet of powder that needed mixing with boiling water and at least an hour to set before it would become fully usable. It was hot pink, notoriously sticky, and had a distinct smell. Some parents found it weird and questioned what its purpose was, but clearly, in these ads and product packages, Super Stuff had tons of uses. You could stretch it into a face, a balloon, different shapes, and even fling it around like this. The possibilities were endless, as long as endless meant its uses were actually pretty limited and about as vague as the product name itself. Despite not really having a purpose beyond just being a sort of abstract plaything, Super Stuff still gained popularity, and not long after its initial release, it was sold pre-made in an airtight container, so there was no more boiling and only instant fun. This made it even more accessible to curious kids and helped develop the world of slime, or what I like to call the slimeverse, early on. The next popular slime product wouldn't come around until 1976, when Slime Compound was made by Mattel. It was similar enough to Super Stuff, but definitely had a few differences. Slime was bright green instead of pink, had less viscosity, and, as the main part of its gimmick, was packaged in a little plastic trash can. This might not seem overly important, but this trash bin helped jumpstart the trend of products that were produced with the sole intention of just being gross. And yeah, that sounds weird, but the gross factor, as we'll call it, went on to have a pretty decent place in pop culture as it progressed. A toy that was made to be strange or uninviting was also made enticing by those same factors, offering elements that might seem a little weird, but that encouraged curiosity and exploration. While things like slime in a trash can, or the slime variants that came with little worms, bugs, or eyeballs in them, weren't for everybody, the kids that were interested in exploring the dirty side of things now had a clean, accessible avenue to play through that was marketed specifically to them. So while it might seem a little weird to be playing with what's essentially marketed as sludge at the bottom of a garbage bin, this kind of marketing helped push the unorthodox nature of slime, strange or gross products, and consequently the slime fad altogether. Mattel's slime was pretty popular for what it was, especially since it came in such a recognizable package, selling $8 million worth in 1977. And part of what made it appealing was described in its slogan right on the packaging. It's gooey, drippy, oozy, cold, and clammy. When comparing that kind of product description to other popular toys of the time, like Cher dolls and Star Wars action figures, a pile of goop that's guaranteed to be clammy seems a little out of place, but that's part of what gave Mattel's slime success. While some parents or even kids themselves may have stayed away because of how gross it seemed, having a gimmick like clamminess or just a generally abstract playstyle is what set slime apart from other toys on the market. After Slime's success, more companies made similar versions of their own slime-like products in the following years and also started introducing accessories or other toys to complement them. The 80s saw toys like Hordak's Horde Slime Pit, a plastic playset with an area for slime to drip from the mouth of a skull. Ectoplasm, inspired by Ghostbusters, also complete with slime-spitting plastic ghost toys, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Retro Mutagen Ooze. These were all products that only had the purpose of being squishy and slimy and were intentionally marketed as being a bit strange and gross, yet they were among some of the most popular toys of their times. One of the first introductions I had to slime as a concept was through Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie, made in 1995. After seeing the purple ooze that's shown throughout the movie, even though it's kind of meant to be this guy's snot, I was suddenly interested in getting my hands on it. Despite it being used as a way to electrocute people and control their minds, there was still something about the color and how gooey it looked that really fascinated me. 
As far as I know, there were surprisingly never any licensed versions made of the purple ooze that's seen in the movie, but as a kid who liked to make mud pies and shampoo potions, my interest in yet another goopy substance was definitely piqued even if I couldn't play with it. Slime-based toys weren't the only options available for other kids like me that liked to play with their hands. Other tactile products like Play-Doh, Silly Putty, water beads like Orbeez, and those squishy blob sacks full of goo <laughs> were also around as something that were hands-on and could be squished in almost any way you wanted. But even though these definitely provided their own kinds of fun, they were still missing that sort of drippy and gelatinous quality that slime offers, something that can feel like it has a mind of its own and is extra satisfying to play with. But what if you wanted to do more than just squish slime in your hands? What if, for some reason, you might want a pile of it poured on your head while you look shocked and confused? If you're somehow out of the loop, Nickelodeon, the children's TV network, is pretty infamous in the slime-verse for its affinity for slime, particularly liquidy green slime that's dumped onto children. It does sound kind of weird when I say it like that, but seriously, if you never wanted to get slimed as a kid, or at any age really, you either didn't watch enough Nickelodeon or just had zero taste. Nickelodeon's first slime products were modeled after some of the earliest and most notable Nickelodeon slimings as seen on the sketch comedy show You Can't Do That on Television. While water and pies were also sometimes thrown on the actors, the iconic Nickelodeon green slime was way more notable and was used from the very first episode. Since it was the 80s, and unfortunately things get more unregulated and unmentionable in history the further back you go, the first batch of slime used on the show was actually a bucket of food scraps from the studio's cafeteria mixed with water, and it was only green because it had been sitting for a week and had gotten moldy. But the studio, being the cool people that they were, just dumped it on a cast member anyway, and even kept using a slime recipe of moldy, rotten food until the cast complained enough that they made some changes. Sorry if this ruins the illusion for any 80s kids out there, but sliming wasn't really as cool and fun as it seemed back in the day. Ironically though, the first slime products that were inspired by the show were a green slime shampoo and liquid soap made in 1986, which are essentially the complete opposite of moldy food scraps. While soap seems like the best option to get that perfect slime effect at home without any mess, I'm sure most kids just use the whole bottle all at once, which seems a little bit wasteful, but I'm sure I would have done the exact same thing. Actually, I think I did do the same thing, but with only regular kids shampoo and with this thing staring at me while I did it, which was definitely not as cool or exciting. You Can't Do That on Television had a varying recipe for their infamous green slime, sometimes using gelatin powder, baby shampoo, flour, and even oatmeal as additives to give it the best goopy, viscous visual effect. And as much as some of the actors complained about how challenging of a condition it was to work under or how hard it was to get out of their hair, Nickelodeon continued the slime features on the show and, as most people may already know, carried the green slime over onto its other shows in later years. The same year that Nick's slime soaps were produced, a new show also started airing on the Nickelodeon network, a trivia game called Double Dare. And maybe you can tell by the logo of this show that it had a little something to do with even more of Nickelodeon's slime. The regular slime pouring from the ceiling in You Can't Do That on Television was taken to the next level in Double Dare. Slime was an even bigger and more frequent part of the show, regularly showing up in different obstacle course levels and physical challenges, though they of course still sometimes just dumped it on the contestants' heads. What made Double Dare even more interesting though wasn't just that there was slime involved, but also any other goopy, sticky substance that the studio could get their hands on. Because each episode originally only had a budget of $10,000, the crew worked with what they could get to make things more entertaining and ended up throwing things like whipped cream and baked beans onto contestants during the show, in addition to the classic slime that was also made of who only knows what. Despite all of this food business causing a few cleanup and mold issues, Double Dare was renewed for a second season and stuck around for years after it first aired in 1986. While being covered in baked beans and a vague green substance may not be some people's idea of fun, most people who watched the show were at the very least super interested in the mess of it all, or wanted to be fully covered in it themselves. I was too young to ever see episodes of the original Double Dare, but Family Double Dare and Double Dare 2000 had enough reruns shown on the games and sports-themed Nick channel, Nick Gas, <laughs> back in the day, that I watched the show pretty frequently and of course always wanted to be on it. 
There was something about picking a giant nose and wading through pools of indiscernible goo that really seemed to resonate with me as a kid. The idea of getting messy just for the sake of it while also competing for the chance to win cool prizes like some of the most 2000s era tech you've ever seen, and for some reason almost always a Yamaha keyboard? It all just seemed like a dream come true. I definitely wasn't the only person who felt this way either, because in middle school, even after the reruns for Double Dare had stopped, the culture around slime and the excitement around being covered in various foods was still sticking around. In school, I was in a club that mainly raised money for different communities and charities, and on more than one occasion, one of the club prizes for meeting our fundraising goals was a slime day held after school. We had big industrial cans of vanilla pudding that we opened up, dyed with food coloring, and just dumped on each club member's head, being gracious enough to give everyone their own turn in a plastic chair behind the school. It didn't even end at vanilla pudding, there was also whipped cream, chocolate syrup, and applesauce just pour it all over you. Can I say confidently that my club leader, who was also the school guidance counselor, was directly inspired by Nickelodeon slime? I don't really know, but I do know that whatever the intention was, and however weird it all seems in retrospect, at the time, I felt like I was living my best Double Dare lifestyle, and it was still really fun for what it was as a kid. Double Dare wouldn't be the last TV show to feature slime, especially since in 1992, Nick produced a product that was a lot more similar to the slime toys before it. Gak was a slime produced by Nickelodeon and Mattel, the same creators of the original green garbage can slime. Similarly to Mattel's slime, Gak was marketed as something unique, a little strange, and intentionally gross. It came in multiple bright colors with a few different accompanying playsets and accessories, but most of all, it was promoted as something that grossed out adults and was just for kids. In some of the 90s Gak commercials, an older woman can be seen looking disapprovingly and being disgusted by how Gak made fart noises if squished in the right way. After the original Nickelodeon Gak, there came a pretty long list of spin-off Gak products and accessories over the years, with variants like glow-in-the-dark, glittery, and scented slimes to accompanying toys like a Gak vacuum, Gak Inflator, and a make-your-own Gak Lab. Nick was clearly going pretty hard in the Gak business. Aside from Nickelodeon-branded slime, there was still an overall interest in slime and all things similar. The movie Flubber starring Robin Williams was made in 1997 and is essentially about a sentient slime creature that also happens to be a familiar Nickelodeon green color. A non-Nickelodeon branded slime known as Flarp also came around, likely as a competitor to Gak, and was specifically branded as a noise putty that would make fart sounds when pushed around in the container. Slime continued to grow in popularity as Nickelodeon just kept on dishing it out, making iconic slime-themed events around the Kids' Choice Awards and at their various hotels and resorts. Their logo for a good while was even just an orange splatter shape, and while it wasn't green, it was a clear homage to the slime that started it all. But as with all trends, the slime fad on Nickelodeon and in general didn't last forever. Kids Choice Award slimings were and are still a regular sight to see, but as Double Dare and other shows like it faded from the network, the demand for Gak and similar slime products started to die down too. That is, until the Great Slimening of 2016. It wasn't actually called that, but it was kind of a big deal, especially in retrospect. Slime had, until this point, mostly existed as something kind of wacky and weird, and was marketed with that in mind, too. But by 2016, a trend started to appear online of making your own slimes at home, and not just goopy green ones to gross out adults, but fun, pretty colored slimes with different additives that made them aesthetically pleasing. Given that it was so easy to make, most commonly with a base of school glue and either borax or contact solution to create a chemical reaction, tons of people were making their own slimes mostly kids and parents for something that was a cheap and easy DIY toy. But some people noticed that slime wasn't just a great way to occupy kids and help them explore, but that when squished and swirled and poked in just the right way, interacting with slime was kind of satisfying. And so, as I'm sure most people are probably already aware, amidst a growing culture of oddly satisfying and ASMR online content, slime very quickly rose not just in popularity, but in marketability. Slime-based content creators were making hundreds of videos based solely around the squeezing and poking of their homemade slimes. While I'm sure some people still found the concept a little weird or the feeling of it a little icky, 
this new era of slime derailed the gross factor that had been built up mainly by Nickelodeon and took the aesthetics in a new direction. Instead of bugs and eyeballs being used like in Mattel's old trash can slime, satisfying content creators were now including things like glitter, sprinkles, styrofoam, and plastic toys squished into their slimes. Because this aesthetically pleasing and oddly satisfying theme was a lot more accessible and appealing than an intentionally disgusting product, and largely thanks to the nature of how trends progress on the internet, slime found a new way to cement itself in pop culture. And as with anything that becomes popular, like moldy green sludge poured onto children, there will almost always be some sort of way that a company finds to capitalize on it. Elmer's, a popular school glue producer, started to create glue that was specifically marketed as a slime base and eventually sold their own line of slime called Goo. I gotta give them points for the name, that's pretty creative. Other creative-based brands like Crayola also started producing their own slime, selling items from kits to branded essentials. But most of all, the content creators that were making satisfying videos online that had been DIYing their own slimes for content had started to perfect their recipes and eventually started selling their own branded slimes themselves. Since Nickelodeon Gak was out and cool, pretty slimes were in, gone were the days of marketing ghost ectoplasm or neon green farting sludge. These new influencer slimes came in appealing scents and colors mostly centered around food. And also unlike the slime variants of the past, modern slime was marketed with a clear purpose. While super stuff was more abstract with its intended playstyle, and later slimes often needed to be improved upon with plastic toys and accessories, modern slime only had to fulfill a simple purpose. To be not just satisfying, but a fidget toy. From aptly named fidget spinners to squishies to poppets in every style you can think of, the culture of fidgeting and fidget toys has really exploded in recent years, and slime, even after only becoming trendy back in 2016, has remained prominent and is a huge element of fidgeting as well. It's pretty clear that slime and fidget toys are geared towards a younger audience when you see products like this. But I'm sure that adults in the 80s and 90s had just as similar of a reaction to the slime products back in the day. It seems I've unfortunately come to a point where I am now the old lady that kids tease and make fun of in the old gag commercials, and that's kind of a weird realization to come to. I'm sure the kids covered in rotten food back in the 80s never thought we would have ended up here. And even though I never got to live my dream of picking a giant nose full of slime on Double Dare 2000, that sounds weird to say out loud, <laughs> I'm still interested to see where the future of the slime verse will take us next. A huge thank you to Kayla Geary, M. Wee, Dylan Webb, Kevin Evans, Paper Sam, The Goomba Mattress, Sarah, Unen Omandor, and the rest of my patrons for supporting me. You're all invited to the Patron Vanilla Pudding Slime Day coming up on February 31st.